For I consider that our present sufferings cannot even be compared to the coming glory that will be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of God who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers together until now. Not only this, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with endurance. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how we should pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings. Good morning. This is fun to be here. Thank you so much um, for having me. And uh, a few months ago, Charlie called me out of the blue, and he just said, hey, uh, we're, we're having, you know, another baby, and I wondered if you could come and speak. And I said, that would be great. I would love it. Uh, so I see the, the pattern <laughs> has emerged. When the first time I came back here to speak, and by the way, uh, hello to all of you I've never met, and uh, hello to all of you that I've known for a while. Uh, the pattern that emerged was that every time Charlie and Sarah had a baby, I got to come back and speak. So... Um, I hope they have a lot of babies, but if that's their last one, I'll never see you again. But so um, this is great. And, um, you know, I think everyone expects all pastors to remember all children's names, and we do. Um, but, you know, I thought, that's, that's kind of hard. I don't think Charlie could even remember his kids' names. Do you know the story that, that when Charlie and Sarah had Eleanor, Right? Because I get confused because it, they, they had only had Eleanor for like two weeks. And she was home and they were, you know, you know, rolling around the neighborhood in the buggy and showing her off. And these people that they knew in the neighborhood came up to them and said, Oh, you, you have this new baby. It's, it's wonderful. And what's her name? And Charlie said, It's Evelyn. <laughs> and Sarah just looked at him and said, What is wrong with you? That's not our, we just had one baby and you can't even remember. He said Evelyn. He didn't say Eleanor. So I'm just saying, if I make mistakes, you know, he made them first. So anyway, I'm excited to be back here. We're, I, I like the fact that I'm part of this series, so I didn't have to spend half my time figuring out what to say. So uh, we're in Romans 8. You've just heard it. And I've got this one section. It's beautiful. I mean, people say that Romans 8 is like the jewel and the, you know, the crown of, of the Scripture. So today we're going to be talking about verses 18 through 25, a little bit of 26. I think next week Nick is going to expand on that. And so uh, you have the whole of the Christian life in Romans 8. In verses 1 and 30 and 33, you've got justification. In verses uh, 2 through 17, you have sanctification. That's the growth that we um, experience as Christians. And in verses 18 through 39, we have glorification. So Justification, sanctification, glorification. You can probably figure that we're going to be talking about glorification today. But just to review, the Holy Spirit um, is mentioned 19 times in the first 27 verses of this chapter. The Holy Spirit is described as the spirit of life, verse 2. We walk according to the spirit, verse 4. Our mind is set on the things of the spirit, verse 5. The spirit of God is the spirit of Christ and both the Father and the Son sent the Spirit, verse 9. It's by the Spirit that we put together, or put to death, the deeds of the flesh. Verse 13, we're led by the Spirit. Verse 14, it's the Holy Spirit who testifies to our spirit that we are children of God, verses 15 and 16. We have the first fruits of the Spirit, verse 23. It's the Holy Spirit who prays for our weaknesses, verses 26 and 27. Now, ironically, in the passage I have, uh, 18 through 25, the Spirit only comes up once. But in general, the Spirit is, um, is throughout the whole chapter. And glorification 
Um, even though it's only mentioned three times, it's the overarching theme. So if you go back one verse to verse 17, it says this, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So today we're going to talk about suffering, on the one hand, and glory. This, this world, this life... It's full of suffering, and, uh, and then we're looking forward to glory. Um, Paul says in verse 18, he's comparing. He says, I, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Um, Sarah and Charlie look pretty happy in that picture. I don't think Sarah you know, is saying today, man, that was so hard. I just, you know, like if you go see Sarah at the hospital, or you see her at, at their house, or whenever you see her, she's probably not going to go on and on and on about, I don't know if it was worth it. You know, I mean, those nine months, and then that hospital, and the pain. And even though I had some drugs, I don't know if she did or not. Uh, you know, she's not going to go on and on and on and wonder I don't know, are these kids really worth the pain that I went through? She'll probably say, yeah, wasn't that great, but look what we have. We have this, this beautiful family. And, um, and that's what Paul says. He says, you know, I, I, I don't even consider that the pain and the suffering that we go through in this life is worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, you think that's kind of a weird thing to say, glory that will be revealed in us. You kind of think of glory as being out there. And yet he's saying it's going to be revealed in us. It's a strange word. It's an odd Greek um, construction that's not normal. It's actually saying revealed into us. It's the, it's the word ice. And you're going, I, that doesn't mean anything to me. But uh, it really it means in us and to us. And maybe the best way to think of it is the glory that, will, that is in store for us. There's a lot of similarities I've found in Romans 8 and 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul, the same person, said, Outwardly, we're wasting away. You're probably looking at me and go, Steve, you look a little bit older last time we saw you. And, you know, to be fair, I didn't, I, I, for some reason I couldn't sleep last night, so I look much better than I normally do um, <laughs> right now. Uh, though outwardly, we're wasting away, yet inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Something's happened to us when we come to Christ, and he begins to work in us. And though outward, our outward shell has only got so many heartbeats, you know, I, I, I had a couple back surgeries, and the, the back doctor, I don't know if this was good, he says, you know, I don't think our backs were only made to last more than seven or eight years. I'm going, thanks, doc. But um, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So Paul says, you know, we're falling apart on the outside, but we're being renewed on the inside. And he says, I, you know, my troubles are light and momentary. Now, if he could say that, you know, what can we say? Because here's what he said in another place, again in 2 Corinthians. He says, five times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. You know, they say that they, they, they gave them 39 lashes because 40 would kill you. So he said, 40, you know, I, I did this five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned with rocks. When you're in Colorado, you got to make that point. Um, three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day in the, adrift in the sea, I faced danger from rivers, robbers, Gentiles, Jews. I've been hungry and thirsty, often been without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Most of us couldn't say that. And, um, and yet he says, those are light and momentary compared with the glory that's coming. Um, if, if you like to read C.S. Lewis, I encourage you to read a, a, an article, which actually was a sermon called The Weight of Glory. Because uh, the, the, the New Testament word glory is doxa, and that's where we get doxology from. The doxology that we sing, you know, praise God from whom all blessings flow, that's doxa, that's glory. But in the Old Testament, glory was kavod, looks like kabod, but it means physical weight. 
And so C.S. Lewis wrote a wonderful sermon that he called The Weight of Glory. And it's a play on words because glory means substance and weight and heaviness. He also wrote a book called The Great Divorce. The other day my son, he's not a big reader, but he, he read The Great Divorce. I said, that's amazing. Let's talk about it. Because in The Great Divorce, Lewis does a fantasy thing. He says it wasn't intended to be exactly theologically correct in all ways, but he's making a point. It's about people that are in hell getting on a bus and going to visit heaven. <clears throat> it's fascinating. And when they get to heaven... The people from hell, just they don't have much, they're like ghosts. They don't weigh anything, so they can't even push down a blade of grass. It hurts them to walk on the grass, whereas the people in heaven are solid people. An apple weighs as much as a bowling ball. And, and water, even if it's cascading down a stream, is solid. So there's the solid people, and what Lewis is doing is saying, when you come into a relationship with God, he gives you substance, he gives you glory, you weigh something, the great divorce. And um, so that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I don't, the stuff we're going through now, it, he's not dismissing it. It hurts. It's painful. But the glory that's coming is, uh, is going to be so big, so heavy, so weighty, so substantial. We won't be thinking, gosh, you know, I don't know if it's, if it's equal in the scales. Now, what he does next is something that you don't find much in the scriptures, but he goes off on a tangent and tells us some things about the universe. You know, we're always wanting exhaustive knowledge. Um, he doesn't give us exhaustive, but he, get, he like pulls the curtain back a little bit. And he says, now, the creation... He's talking about subhuman creation, the rocks and the trees and the animal kingdom and all those things. He's saying, in, in a, which we are, you know, in our world, we're very concerned about. You know, we have the whole spectrum. There's people in the world that just don't care, you know, about, about nature and whether it gets polluted or anything like that. And then there's other people on the other end of the spectrum that worship the earth. You know, the earth is our mother and... And we got to take care of her and listen to her, and she's our God, really. So the whole spectrum of things, because we don't know what to do with creation. Paul says we are connected to creation, actually. God is the author of, he, he created the earth, and he created the animals, he created the plants, he created the seas, he created everything, and then he created us. But when we, we fell, everything fell, so we are connected. He says, for the creation waits in eager expectation. He's personifying subhuman creation. And um, this, this is common actually throughout the, 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 the scriptures. In Psalm 65, the hills and the meadows and the valleys sing together. And in other places, the earth mourns. So here it says the creation is waiting with eager expectation for, for what? For God to, for Jesus to come back? It, yes, but he doesn't say it that way. He says, for the children of God, you and me, to be unveiled like a statue. Like, you know, you, you go somewhere and there's, there's a work of art and they put this, you know, tarp over it and everybody cranes their neck to see what's this thing going to look like. That's what he's saying. It's us because we're so connected with creation. Because it fell when we fell. And when we are restored, it will be restored. It's an unusual word here, eager expectation. John Stott said it means to wait with the head raised um, when the, and the eye fixed on that point of the horizon from which the expected object is to come. The, the, the creation is craning its neck to see when's it going to happen. When are they, meaning you and me, going to be brought into the way it's supposed to be? I, a lot of you know I like photography, so I, uh, I wanted to take one picture last summer because it was you know, COVID and you're just sitting around. I go, I'm going to take this one picture. And about six hours from our house is Moab, Utah. And there's this one arch. You know, there's Arches National Park, lots of arches. And... Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out the time here, you know. 
because that's, that's important. So I, I go to, I drive to Utah to get one photograph. And it's a photograph of the sun coming up over the horizon and this one arch. And I, I was there and um, I talked to somebody in, the, in one of the um, photography stores in Moab. And I said, gee, I wonder what time I would need to get there to escape the crowds because everybody likes to do this particular arch. And she said, I wouldn't even bother. I wouldn't even bother going. And in my mind, I went, okay, then I'm going. I don't care what you say. I'm glad you said it that way because that makes me want to do it all the more. So I got up. I set my alarm for 2.30 in the morning. So I got up at 2.30, drove my little car over. It took about an hour to get to this one spot, and I got there first. I was so excited. I thought, I'm so professional. You know, and I, I had to walk a ways to get to this spot, and the, the arch is there, and I set up my tripod, and nobody else is there yet. I'm waiting two hours and finally, people trickle in from all over the world. That's kind of the fun part of it. And we're all going to be waiting for this. And I look over, and here's a, a young woman sitting on a rock, you know, and a, you know, she's, she's like meditating. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. And then I also saw that her friend was photographing her meditating, so Instagram would see her. So I'm not sure how much she was meditating, but she looked cool. And then, and then I'm there, and other people are showing up, and it's great, and I'm just, I'm so excited. And then I realized that the very last second, I'm not even pointing the right direction for the sun, because suddenly everybody knows it's going to come up at this one moment, and everybody suddenly is getting quiet, and they're looking at this one place, and I just turned, I was able to get it, but that whole group of people was there for one reason, we're just looking, we just can't wait till it comes, and we're hoping, and it was beautiful, and everyone was stunned, everyone was kind of in awe of it, for about 10 minutes, you know, we're just like, this is, this is as good as it gets, you know, and then everybody filter away, because that was it, but that's what creation is doing, waiting for us, for us to be transformed. For the creation, verse 20 says, was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. Creation didn't do anything wrong, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Um, it says in Genesis 3, God said to Adam, the ground is cursed because of you. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You know, and you're out there and mowing your lawn, and there's all this stuff that you've got to get rid of that wasn't originally intended to be there. So creation fell when we fell. It wasn't creation's fault. Um, and it was subjected to frustration by the will of the one who subjected it, which is really God. I mean, Satan was involved in the fall, and we were involved in the fall, and it was our fault, but God's the one who said, who pronounced it. And so the world, as beautiful as it is, is not the way it was intended to be. We walk around in Colorado, and, uh, you know, there's a part of our brain is like, I hope a bear doesn't get us. You know, I got some bear spray the other day because Darlene thought it'd be a good idea, but I got, I didn't spring for the $60 bear spray that's on your belt with the, you know, little holster, I, brought, I just got the little one that fits in your pocket and you will never have time to get to it when the bear <laughs> shows up. But, you know, in the future, we're not going to be afraid. We're not going to need bear spray. They're not going to be killing us. They're not going to be killing it's like, it's like it's something's wrong with this. Now, I am no scientist. And you're going, we know that, Steve. Uh, but the second law of thermodynamics, doesn't that sound fascinating, states that there is a natural tendency in any isolated system to degenerate into a more disordered state, which results in an increase in entropy. Entropy is the general trend of the universe toward death and disorder. It means things are falling apart. You leave your car <coughs> out. You know, you, I was driving you know, somewhere last week out into eastern Colorado, and I saw these old trucks, and they look cool. Why do they look cool? Because they're all oxidized. They're falling apart. They've been left in a field. They're not getting better. You know, the other night I was going to bed. I really needed to get a lot of sleep, and Darlene yells, Steve, get up. The, the, uh, the, the sink is, is exploding. You know, there's water. Can we, you know, what did we do? Turns out, Maybe this is the most important thing you need to hear today. Uh, don't put rice in the disposal. I, I can't thought that would be okay, and yet it expanded and blew out our whole system. Now, um, I didn't know that could happen. 
But uh, it wasn't even a lot. It was just a little. So, you know, the thing is, I could have said, you know what? Let's just sleep on it. Because probably in the morning it will fix itself. That's what I wanted to say. She didn't go for that because she's a little more practical. And um, it, it, would never ha- it would never fix itself, right? Stuff in your head, it doesn't fix itself. You can't, like, go on vacation. Hey, maybe they'll come back and it'll be... F- doesn't. Things don't go towards more order. We had to call the plumber on a Sunday, which is what they probably love, you know? And because um, things don't work out right. That's the way the world's broken. You know, I'll never forget um, this passage 40 years ago, 35 years ago. We had a singles group, and in the singles group was a wonderful young woman, and she uh, kind of guided our group when we went on a backpack trip, but she was a geologist. And she loved nature, and she loved rocks uh, more than I do. And she came to me one day and said, uh, hey, Steve, um, I was reading in Romans 8 about how the creation is not, it's subjected to frustration. Um, why is that? And I explained the fall and how we were connected to creation, and creation fell, and nature, and all that, and... I'll never forget, she started to cry. I was like, Kathy, what? You know, well, there's us too. You know, we're going through a lot of pain. She says, I can't believe, you know, but the nature is in pain. It's like groaning. I said, yes, but we are too. But she was really focused on the rocks. She's like, I really, it really bothers me that that all, and, and she really cared. I'll always remember that conversation because it says in verse 22, we know The whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up until the present time. And not only so, now he's he's, he's gone to creation, talked about all that, now he's going to come back to us. And he uses the word groan. There's so many key words in this passage. There's suffering, there's hope, there's weight, there's groan, there's, there's glory. But groan comes in. The, the creation is groaning somehow. Somebody said, I don't know if it's true, the sounds of nature are in a minor key. Maybe that's true. The, the howl of the wind, you know, the sound of whales. Um, but he says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, which means when you become a Christian, you receive the Spirit to indwell you. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us as a down payment we ha- that's why I called this sermon the now and the not yet. Because the Holy Spirit comes to live in us and to wake us up and to give us life and to begin transforming us and all of that. And even though we, we, will, we are not what we will be, we're not what we used to be. And the first fruits is the idea back in Israel's day of giving the first things to God. But it's also an installment, a down payment that the rest is certain to come. We also groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, sonship, the redemption of our bodies. And you're thinking, wait a minute, um, adoption, I thought we were already adopted as sons. I thought we were already redeemed, but not fully. So there's a sense in which we've already been adopted to sonship, and we are already redeemed, but not fully in reality, in physical reality. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Ray Stedman said, excuse me, (coughs) we groan because of the ravages that sin makes in our lives and the lives of those we love. And so... We groan in disappointment, in bereavement, in sorrow. We groan physically in our pain, our limitations. Life consists of a great deal of groaning. Even Jesus was not spared this groaning. When he was on the cross, he quoted Psalm 22. And I don't think he was just quoting it as an interesting Bible reference. He's on the cross in tremendous pain, and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from what? 
the words of my groaning. So nature groans, and we groan, and our Savior who came for us groaned. So the other day, I um, was thinking about groaning. There's a little delicatessen that is near our house, and we love to go there, and, and we've been going there for as long as we've been in Colorado. And so it was the place our daughter got her first job. And uh, the woman who runs it is, is Betsy. And uh, her name is Betsy Oliver. And it's Oliver's Deli. And so we just love to go there. And I was wanting to go to study. Um, grade some papers. And because uh, I teach a class. <coughs> so I go. It's on Monday. And I, I drive up. And it's closed. It's never closed on Monday. And I go, why, why is the deli closed? So I, I'm there, and, and there's a uh, guy in the car in the parking lot, and he gets out and walks over and says, the reason it's closed is because Betsy's son died. Betsy's got a 33-year-old son. He's our kid's age. And uh, he's been through ups and downs, but that morning he passed away. And I was just shocked because we know her per- you know, pretty well, not close friends. And I came back the next day because I thought, you know, I know Betsy. She gets up at 4 in the morning, comes in there and bakes bread. It's fresh every day. And I gave her a hug, and we talked a little bit. And she said, you know, I lost a a baby in childbirth. I didn't know that. And um, we were talking about grieving and pain and groaning. and, And then, you know, I know that she went through a divorce a few years ago. She's been through a lot of groaning. And, um... As I read this passage, I thought, wow, that's what life is a lot of times. So I'm, and, and you would see her and you go, she is just so upbeat and happy and, you know, great to have around. And everybody loves her. Everybody, everybody loves her. But what do we have to look forward to? The redemption of our bodies, the glory to come. 1 Corinthians talks about it a little bit. It says, it, in the sa- it's the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they'll be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but they'll be raised as spiritual bodies. And you're going, wait a minute, it's spiritual bodies. What is it? Is it spiritual or is it a body? Because, you know, the Greeks thought, and when I went to college, they taught me, you know, the future is we'll be free from these prisons that we live in. But that's not the biblical view. The biblical view is these bodies are good. Yes, they're running down because they're broken, <clears throat> but they're going to be transformed. So we will have spiritual bodies. I don't know exactly what they'll be like. You know, Jesus is, in a sense, the first fruit, so we can get a little hint from him because, remember, Jesus shows up after his resurrection. People don't automatically recognize him. You know, at the tomb, they think he's a gardener. You know, they're walking to Emmaus. They don't even know who he is. And then all of a sudden, they can, it's like, yeah, that's who he is. But he still has some marks on him. So I don't know exactly what it'll be like. I've got my 50th 5-0 high school reunion coming up in September. I'm not sure I'm going. It's in Indiana, but I'd kind of like to. And I know what would happen. You know, you sit around, and you're looking at somebody, and you're going, wait a minute. (laughs) I... That, okay, okay, I haven't seen you for 50 years. I remember now. Is it going to be like that in heaven? Perhaps. We'll, you know, our bodies will be better and um, functional. But somehow Jesus, you know, he could eat fish. So he had a human body. He could also walk through walls. There's a wonderful passage in the appendix of Lord of the Rings. Because uh, C.S. Lewis and his friends, J.R.R. Tolkien and others, would sit around and talk about this stuff. And I think this was Tolkien's attempt at thinking about what we might be like in the future. He's he's talking about a great man, it was actually Aragorn, who who dies in The Lord of the Rings. it's, It's in the appendix, what happens after all that. And it says this, Then a great beauty was revealed in him. So that all who after came there looked on him in wonder. For they saw that the grace of his youth 
and the valor of his manhood and the wisdom and manage, majesty of his age were blended together. We got these little grandkids. You know, I'm looking at these little kids. That they're so beautiful. And we, we joke with our, you know, five-year-old Stevie and, and six-year-old Emmy. Like, you're not growing up. You're not getting any older, right? And then they go, yes, we are. And he says, well, at least you're not going to be a teenager. Oh, yes, we are, you know, and the whole thing. Um, because they're so beautiful. You don't want them to, to grow up. And then, you know, people become young men and women. And you go, wow, you're, it's amazing, you know. Look at you. you you're a full-grown man or woman. And, uh, and then there is something to us, I guess, when we get older, we have some wisdom or majesty or something. That seems like an overstatement. But <coughs> Tolkien is saying somehow, I wonder if you could blend all those together. You know, the beauty in, uh, of a kid who's just beautiful and young and joyful, like Lindsay was saying about Jolie. And, uh, and the valor of manhood and the, and the wisdom and majesty of this, his age were blended together, and long there he lay, an image of the splendor of the kings of men in glory undimmed before the breaking of the world. I don't know what it's going to be like exactly, but it's going to be glorious. And so finally, Paul says, all that I've just talked about, this suffering that's going to lead to this glory that's going to, going to outshine all the pain, it's called a certain thing that's going to happen, and we call that hope. It's not like our normal hope. It's not like, I wonder if the Cowboys will ever win a Super Bowl in my lifetime again or even get close. I really hope they do. Needless to say, that's not on real solid ground. You know, we don't know that for sure at all. Biblical hope is like, oh, no, we know this is going to happen. And we are putting everything on it. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we don't yet have, we wait for it patiently. In Hebrews it says, therefore we who have fled to him for refuge. I thought, isn't that an interesting description of Christians? We who have fled to him for refuge have, can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. And now let me borrow a little bit from Nick's passage, just one bit, from the next verse. He says, now in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we don't know what to pray for as we should, and we would all say amen, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with what? Groanings. There it is again. So let me close by saying, what does Betsy have to look forward to? What has she got in life? I would say she has a living, risen Savior who groaned. She has the spirit living in her who groans with her. She has a heavenly father who loves her. And she has this hope that is certain to come at any moment. And so she waits patiently as she gets up every morning at four to bake bread. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are just on the other side of this thin veil. And I'm sure that you long for the day and the moment when all of this will be transformed. And we realize that it's not just us, it's creation that is standing on tiptoe, waiting for the moment. And that you will bring everything back to the way it should be. So we pray for those in our body, in our community here that are going through pain and suffering and groaning. And we pray that as a church body, friends, families, that we might be a source of compassion and comfort and encouragement to one another. We long for the day when we get together more like we used to, 
and we'll appreciate it more. Um, we thank you for your love for us. And we thank you for the certain hope um, of what is coming and the glorious weight and substance of it. And we thank you that the Spirit lives in us to remind us that we belong to you and to transform us bit by bit every day and to also give us the hope that we sometimes don't even know if we have that you will come back for us just as you said and we pray all this in Jesus name and we all said